Amen, 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 amen. We're coming to you this morning live from the sanctuary of Progressive Community Church. We are here in the building today in the name of Jesus. They say as we do every day, this is the day that the Lord has made and that we will rejoice. we made up in our mind, hallelujah, that we are going to rejoice and to be glad in this day. Hallelujah. We made up in our spirits that we're going to rejoice on this day. We made up in our soul. Hallelujah. That we're going to rejoice on this day. And it's something when your spirit and your soul connect. Hallelujah. With your body. It's something when we become one with God. So that's our prayer today. That we become one with God on this day in the midst of our worship and in the midst of our praise that we that we become one with God on this Palm Sunday hallelujah this this Sunday that we become one with God wherever you're watching us now we as we do each week we pray we pray that you would, 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 would if you're watching us from your home or your car wherever you are that, that you would prepare your heart and prepare your home to worship God this morning. Prepare your heart and prepare your home to worship our Lord and our Savior on this day. Pre prepare your life, hallelujah, to give God praise and to magnify the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Just, just, just get things right, hallelujah. And as we come, as we enter, into the presence of God. Hallelujah. As we hail the King. He is the King. He Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As we come before the Lord, declaring that there is none like you, Lord, none in heaven or earth. Why don't you prepare your heart now? Prepare, make room for the Lord in your house, in your room, wherever you are. Hallelujah. You might still have your pajamas on, but, but get your heart right. Hallelujah. As we come this morning to worship the Lord. And each week, I tell you, I don't know how God does it. He's just an awesome and amazing God. But, but, but he connects all of us by his divine power and his divine spirit. He connects our house with your house. Hallelujah. And he makes us one in our worship together. And so as we come this morning to worship the Lord and to give glory, honor, and praise to his name, let's do it as the word says on one accord. Let's do it with one spirit as we operate in the truth of the Lord. Hallelujah. Let, let, let's come together in oneness to give God glory, honor, and praise. We're going to pray now. Hallelujah. Most gracious God, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you on today, oh God. Oh God, we magnify you and we lift up holy hands in your sight. We come declaring this morning, God, that there is none like you, O oh God. None like you in the heavens above, O oh God, or in the earth below, or even under the earth, O oh God. We thank you, O oh Lord, my God, for the work of your son Jesus at Calvary's cross, O oh God. It is that work, O oh God, that has rescued us. And we thank you, O oh God, for salvation. We thank you for saving us, O oh God. That that is something that we could not do on our own, oh God. It's something that we could not do by ourselves, God. But it was your spirit. It was your son, Jesus, who gave us a life that we might have a right to the tree of life, oh God. Not, not by works, oh God, that we do, but just by believing on you, oh God. And so today, oh God, we say thank you for salvation. God, we come declaring, oh God, that even though we've accepted you as our Lord and Savior, we said some things we shouldn't have said, God. We've gone some places we shouldn't have gone, God. We thought some thoughts we shouldn't have thought, God. We've done some things that we ought not have done. And then, God, you, you called us to do some things that we failed to follow through on what you called us to do. 
And today, God, we, we simply say, Lord, have mercy on us, oh God. Lord, we pray that you would wash us of our iniquity and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Have mercy on us today, God, as we move forward in you, God. Your word says that we confess our sins, that you're still the God who's faithful and you're just and you'll forgive us of our sin and you'll cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. And so today, God, we come confessing, oh God, that we might, oh God, be, be covered by the blood of Jesus. That as we approach your throne on this day, oh God, that as we come and we recognize who you are, that you are our, our God, you are our king, you are our master, that we're covered in the blood, oh God. That we're made holy and that we're made righteous, oh God, not in and of ourselves, but through the blood of Jesus. And God, on oh, today, we thank you for the blood, the blood that still works, the blood that still has power, the blood that still reaches to the highest mountain and the lowest valley. We thank you. God, we thank you for the blood that cleanses us, but it's also the blood that keeps us, oh God. We thank you today for the blood, oh God. We pray now, oh God, that you would move in our midst, oh God. Move in the midst of our service this morning, oh God. Move in our midst, oh God. Move in the midst, oh God. Hallelujah. By your might, by your power, and by your Holy Spirit, oh God. Bring every yoke. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, free us from bondage this morning, oh God. The enemy wants us to walk in darkness, oh God. But we thank you that those who once walked in darkness have seen the great light. It is the light of the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We've seen the light of the Lord operate in our life. And for that, God, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you, oh God, hallelujah, because Lord, the enemy has a false light, God, a replication of your light, and he uses it, God, to draw us in that he might, Lord, keep us in bondage. But today, God, we thank you, thank you Lord. that we are free in you. We thank you for freedom, oh God. We thank you that we have freedom to worship you, God. Freedom to praise you in spirit and in truth. And so today, God, we thank you for that freedom today, oh God. We thank you, oh God, that you've moved us, oh God, to another realm in you, oh God. That we're no longer servants of the, of the ruler of this world, oh God. That, that, that the darkness of this world and the enemy of this world no longer has power over us, God. But we thank you, God, for the power that you placed inside of us, oh God. Power to tread over scorpions and serpents, God, and not be injured, oh God. You've given us power, oh God, to speak truth to power, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And we thank you for that power today, oh God, the power of your Holy Spirit that works in us, oh God. We thank you for that power today, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for the light of Jesus that shines in us, oh God. The authentic light of the Lord of the world. We thank you for that light, God. Hallelujah. Lord, let us do as the song says, oh God, let our light shine. Hallelujah. This little light of mine, God, help us to let it shine everywhere that we go. Help us to let the light of the Lord shine that men might see our good works but give glory, honor, and praise to our Father who is in heaven. God, we want to we wanna point others to you, O oh God, and not to us. Not that they see us, O oh God, but that they see all of you, Father. Let that happen on today, God. And then, God, we pray that, that, that there be a move in this place. That, that we do not leave out of this place, God, the same way that we came in. We might move, we might have come in broken, but God, let us leave out blessed. We might have come in hurt, God, but let us leave out healed, oh God. We might Oh God, move now. 
It is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you will. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord on this morning. He's doing a new thing in this place. Hallelujah. God is operating in a new way in this place. And for that we give him praise. We give him glory and honor. And we bless the name of the Lord. Yes, God. Hallelujah. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine.
So why don't you bring your burdens, bring your troubles, bring your trials and your tribulations. Wisdom at his feet at the altar. Hallelujah. Here's the beautiful thing about the altar. There was once upon a time when there was a curtain. Hallelujah. That was in front of the altar and it separated. Separated us from God. Hallelujah. And every year, once a year, and only once a year, could the high priest enter into the Holy of Holies. Hallelujah. Into the most holy place to offer. Hallelujah. Sin on his behalf, the behalf of the nation. But thanks be to God that when Jesus Christ was on the throne, that the veil that was in front of the temple, it was torn into from heaven to earth to the sun. Oh, my God. 
of Jerusalem. You see, these last three years, Jesus has been busy in ministry. Now Jesus is standing in front of Jerusalem. And there's no doubt for his purpose of why he's there. He's, he really has a desire to proclaim the kingdom of God in Jerusalem. In the holy city. In the presence of the temple hierarchy. The scribes and those who are gathered. All of those who are gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. This is the holy season. And Jesus is here to force a decision into the hearts of people. This is the final stand of the relationship that we have with him and with his message. And he understands the risk that he has taken. He knows where this is going. He's going straight into the lion's den without any fear. He's going straight into the burning furnace without any fear. He already knows what's going to happen. At this point of his ministry, Jesus is the opponent of the religious hierarchy. Amen. And they have many false accusations against him. They were irritated with him. He's a pest to them, almost like a pestilence because he's confounding their ministry. He's in the way they want to get rid of him. See, before Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he was in ministry. The gospel reveals to us that Jesus is preaching. He's teaching throughout all the land, both inside the synagogues and outside of the synagogues. And he has chosen 12 disciples. He has ordained them and has given them their missionary instructions. And thousands of people are being fed. 5,000 in one city, 5,000 men plus children and women, you gotta add them more than 4,000 in another time. You got, that's just men with, with, you gotta add all the children and the women that they got them. Yeah. Yeah. People are being healed. Yeah. Demonic spirits are being driven out of people. Yeah. People are being raised from the dead. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. Lazarus is raised from the dead. And then, as he was in ministry, he was mostly in Galilee, as he sent his disciples on a mission, and as they were coming back, they stopped in Samaria. And a new mission, a new ministry started there. As God as Jesus, the Son of God, sat next to the Sumerian woman at the well. By the time they finished the discussion together, she left her water jar. She went back to the city and she told everybody she met that I met a man that told me everything I ever did. He must be the Messiah. I believe he's Christ. And then the people followed her and came back to meet Jesus Christ. He is teaching some strong words at this time. He's near the end of his ministry. Strong words. He's telling people the, the, the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He's saying to the people, those who are repentant believers, he's saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light for the world. A city cannot be hidden when it is located on the hill. He's teaching them how to pray. He's giving an example with the Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven. He's letting them know to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah. And then on top of that, he's got women in ministry 
walking with him. They might not have named them in the gospel. They might not have given all of their names, but women are right there as disciples with his other disciples serving in ministry alongside of Jesus Christ. I want to just go through one day, just one day, when you read Matthew chapter 12 through 13, that's just one day in the life of Jesus Christ's ministry. One day. In this day, it was a Sabbath day, and that's why there's a lot of controversy about Jesus Christ. On the Sabbath, he woke up, he was hungry, and he picked him some corn. And then on the Sabbath day, same day, he enters into the synagogue and heals a man with a withered hand. And the Pharisees lead to conspire against him because he's doing these things on the Sabbath day. He's picking corn on the Sabbath day. He's healing a man on the Sabbath day. But then Jesus goes out and heals a multitude of people right after that. He heals a man possessed with blindness and dumbness. And then the Pharisees accuse him of healing by Beelzebub. The scribes and the Pharisees demand a sign from Jesus Christ, a sign from heaven. And here comes Christ's mother and his brothers, and they come to take him home, but, and, but he boarded a ship on the sea and taught the parables of the kingdom. Amen. And then he sent the multitude away. This is the same day. He sent the multitude away, and then he taught the disciples, the meaning of the parables. And then he travels across the Sea of Galilee, he calms the stormy sea, and he heals a man with a legion of demons. And that's just one day in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus is doing everything to advance the kingdom of God, but the religious hierarchy don't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah. They started charging him and started rumors and controversies against Jesus Christ and his ministry. So now here he is, yeah. getting ready to enter Jerusalem. And they have charged him with all these controversies. They say he's a blasphemer. See, when he claimed to forgive people's sins, they said you are blaspheming against God. In Matthew chapter 9, verse And he crossed over and he came into his own city. Behold, they brought to him a man who was paralyzed, laying on a mat, laying on his own bed. And Jesus saw the faith of these people. And he said, Son, get up, cheer up. Your sins are forgiven you. And but the scribes were there. And they said to themselves, this man blasphemed. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil things in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins, he looked at the paralytic and he said, get up, take up your mat and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. And when the multitude saw it, they marveled and they glorified God who had given authority to this man. 
But some of the scribes who were sitting there, hallelujah, who were sitting there, reason in their hearts, why does that man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? See, they also had an issue with him. Another controversy was the friendships that he kept. He was frequently hanging around with sinners and tax collectors. And see, time and time again, we will read in the Gospels, it speaks of Jesus Christ, how freely and naturally he associated with those who were sinners and who were publicans is what they call it in the Bible, publicans, tax collectors. See, we're not, we, first of all, we got to get the right impression about Jesus Christ. These are not the only people that he's hanging around with. He's hanging around with all kind of people, common people, other people that have a, a different mindset on what Judaism is all about. He's hanging around with strangers. He's not just hanging around with sinners and publicans, but because he has this association with this minority of people, this minority of people, these sinners and these publicans, Jesus Christ. Oh See, the, the sinners were detested because of, of religious reasons. The, the sinners were those who ignored and violated the law and its regulations. But the publican they ostracized him on, in two areas, both religious and social. Because he was a, they are tax collectors, they're working for the Roman government, that, that same government that has, has occupied them. They're, in, they're, they're, being, they're in captivity to these same people that are taxing them. But the main, and, and, and another reason they had issue with Jesus Jesus, because one of his disciples called Matthew was a tax collector. A tax collector. Tax collectors were deemed to be extortionists, cheaters, thieves. If a tax collector came into a Jewish person's house, a, a law-abiding Jewish person's house, their house could be deemed unclean. Mm -hmm. And because the offense increased because Jesus was eating with these people. He invited them. They invited him into their houses. He invited them to come eat with him, to sup with him. See, table fellowship was something that was very intimate and precious to the Jewish people. So the Pharisees are upset. They're in shock. How can he eat with these sinners and with these publicans, these tax collectors, these people? It, it, it's, it's just he's committing to sin himself. Just by eating with them. Why does he eat with these tax collectors and sinners? See, eating is a breach. Eating with them is a breach of etiquette. It's a defiance against their regulations. It's uh, their regulations concerning purity. And what's Jesus' response to this? He starts preaching in parables. <laughs> parables that admonish. Parables that reprimand. Parables that warn. Parables that challenge them. Parables at the same time 
would you invite them if they open up their heart? Passing parables reveal the truth. So the disciples came to him and said, Jesus, why are you teaching them in parables? And Jesus said, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but it has not been given to them. <laughs> and the mysteries of the kingdom work are contained in the parables of the kingdom, they are the hidden secrets from the foundation of the world. See, parables open our eyes they, to deeper insights into Christ, to deeper insights into his kingdom, and they give us a, a glimpse into that spiritual heavenly realm. So Jesus explained, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see, yeah. and hearing they do not hear. Nor do they understand. See, the parables speak a new language. The parables speak about grace. Grace is a new language. See, the law was given through Moses. Hallelujah. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God's unfailing love. And faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. But they're not still through. They're, they're, they still have more controversies against Jesus. They accused him of breaking their traditions. He doesn't fast. He's violating the Sabbath regulations. He's not washing up. He's violating the law, Jesus. You're not sticking with our traditions, Jesus. <laughs> but see, what they didn't understand was that the law that God gave to Moses, yes, it was a perfect standard to live your life by, but that same law, even though it was perfect, it revealed the imperfection that's inside of people. See, the law gave people the knowledge of sin, but not the solution. Jesus Christ himself was born under the law. The law of Moses. It says in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of being his children. Amen. And then Jesus was sinless under the law. Amen. He was the promised Messiah. He came to fulfill the law of Moses. He said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy. I came to fulfill. Amen. Not only did Jesus was he the promise? Hallelujah. He is the solution. Hallelujah. He kept the law. Hallelujah. He's the only person who ever lived that kept the law perfectly. And because he was sinless, he was able to meet the requirements of the sacrifice that was needed to save our soul. Jesus is standing in front of Jerusalem, yeah. ready to go on the next phase of his journey. All right. Hallelujah. They also kept on accusing Jesus because, see, demon spirits were coming out of people. Amen. So they said, You. Only thing that can get rid of devil is the devil. Mm -hmm. That was their belief. See, see, when Jesus again, we're gonna go to Matthew. I'm gonna go to Matthew chapter. Man that was demon possessed. The man couldn't talk. He was mute. 
And when the demon was cast out of the man, the man spoke. And the multitude marveled. And they said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. See, the conflict wasn't that demons, wasn't that demons existed. They knew demons existed. The conflict was how the demons were being driven out. So in Jesus' time, people knew that demons were real. But their belief was that only satanically inspired people could remove the demon because that was their way to inspire people to join them. Because of the miracle of getting rid of the demon, that can get people on board with what they were doing in their witchcraft, in their way of doing things. And that was their thinking. They believed that he was healing and driving out evil spirits through a diabolic delusion. They believed that he was satanically inspired and a false prophet. But their accusations don't make sense. A satanic power cannot remove a satanic power. Amen. If it did, it would be basically terminating its own self. Only God. So these acts that Jesus Christ was doing, removing these evil spirits out of people's lives, it was in connection with the coming kingdom of God. Amen. And it should have been seen and analyzed and interpreted as a sign of the coming of God's kingdom. Amen. Another thing that they accused him of was threatening to destroy the temple. See, in the first year of his ministry, Jesus Christ went to Jerusalem. You can find this story in John chapter 2. He went to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem, and then that's where he cleansed the temple for the first time. When he walked into the temple, it looked and it smelled like a Stockyard Circus. And he immediately became enraged. And, and they had ropes hanging around, so he, he took some ropes and he braided him up a whip. And he dumped the money changers' coins and he knocked things off the table and he said, pick up this stuff and get it out of my father's house. You are turning my father's house into a marketplace. But see, now he's created another enemy, even in his first year ministry, because he's challenging the authority of the high priest. Because the high priest claims control over the central bank of the temple. <laughs> now in the first year of his ministry, they were a little bit careful. So the Sadducees came to him. They, they saw the people were gathered around him and, 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 and believing in him and, 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 and seeing all of his signs and wonders. And they came to him as priests. They didn't deny his identity, but they wanted him to prove it. They said, what miracle can you show us to justify the things that you are doing? But Jesus doesn't want to play that game with them. Amen. The only sign that Jesus offers them is a sign of resurrection. Amen. He said, tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. Amen. But they didn't like that response. <laughs> nor did they understand it. They kept mocking him, calling him a Samaritan and 
saying that he was demon possessed. They, and then the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the and the and the, and the priests they aligned themselves up with the Herodians. That's Herod, the King Herod's people. King Herod is an Edomite from the line of Esau. Esau and Jacob's people, they don't like each other. So they align these priests, these Levites, these men of God, they align themselves up with the prodigy with the, with the, from Esau to come against Jesus Christ. To trap him, to arrest him, and to kill him. And all when they came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they said, Well, some say you John the Baptist. Some say you Elijah, some say you Jeremiah. He says, no, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed. Because no human revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven Amen. revealed it to you. Amen. And then Jesus Christ goes on and he's talking to his disciples and he's telling them that he's going to be rejected when they go into Jerusalem. He's going to be. His death is going to happen while he's in Jerusalem. He's going to be resurrected when he goes into Jerusalem. And he's speaking of this daily and teaching him. His, he says, when I go there, there's going to be people. I'm going to suffer under the leadership of the, the chief priests and under the scribes. And, and he said, they're going to kill me, but on the third day, I'm going to be brought back to life. Amen. But Peter didn't like what Jesus was saying, and Peter took him to the side and said, said, Jesus, Jesus, heaven forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said, Peter, get out of my way, Satan. You are tempting me to sin, and you aren't thinking the way that God thinks, but the way humans think. So take up your cross. And follow Jesus. That's the next thing he said. Take up your cross and follow me. Those who want to come with me must say no to the things that they want and pick up their crosses and follow me. A few other things happened before they entered Jerusalem. Jesus keeps talking about his rejection, his death, and resurrection. They go over to the mount, and he takes Peter and James and John, and they, uh, they were able to see his transfiguration. Yes. And then from there, he goes out and meets a multitude, and a boy with a demon is healed. Mm. And then it's time for the temple. They get ready to go to Jerusalem, but it, they need some temple tax when they go. And, and Peter, been, these people have been coming to Peter saying, look, you need to pay some, some temple tax to us. Don't your master, don't Jesus pay temple tax? And so, Jesus, so Peter went to him and said, he, and Jesus said, well, what do you think, Simon? Who do you think should receive these taxes? Well, who do they get their taxes from, from children or from strangers? And Peter, and Peter said, from strangers. And Jesus said, therefore, the children are exempt. But lest we cause go down to the sea, yes. cast a hook, and the first fish that you catch, yes. look in his mouth and take out the coin yes. and pay the temple tax for both you and me. Right. This happened before going into 
Jerusalem. Amen. So here's Jesus. In front of the gate of the city, going into his final stand, fully conscious of what is getting ready to happen. And he's entering into the city, and a great multitude had come to the feast. See, the multitudes were there because they knew about what happened to Lazarus. They heard that he had, they knew Lazarus was dead. He was thinking it was four days. He was in that tomb. And he rose that, that man got up Amen. from the grave. That was a true sign to the people. Okay. And so they're coming. And they took branches of the palm tree. And they went out to meet him. Yes. And they cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus is sitting on top of a donkey. Yes. See, what people don't understand, some pastors preach that Jesus was poor, and that's why he was on the donkey. But that's not true. No, no, no. When a king in those days, when the king came in peace, he rode on the donkey. But when the king came on the horse, he came for justice, for judgment and war. Amen. So Jesus Christ, even though he knows he's going into warfare, he gets a donkey and he's coming in peace. He enters in peace. And, 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 and I want to just clarify that again. When the king comes on a donkey, he's coming in peace. And you can find that in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. He is righteous and having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey. Your, come, your king is coming in peace. And how do we know that when the king comes on a horse that is war? Go to Revelation. Chapter 19, verse 11. It says, I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. Amen. So here's Jesus. He's coming in peace. Yes. He's not coming in war. Amen. It's not that day yet. In this day, he's coming to save. Amen. And the people are shouting, Hosanna. They're waving their palms and their cloaks and they're spreading them on the road. It's See what they're doing, this is a glorious entry up to the temple. Amen. What they're doing is that they are shouting to Jesus Christ, Psalms 118. We say part of it all the time. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We beg you, O oh Lord, save us. Hosanna, save us. Hosanna means save us. We beg you, O oh Lord, save us. We beg you, O oh Lord, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the Lord's house. The Lord is God. And he has given us life. March in a festive procession with branches to the horns of the altar. These people are honoring Jesus Christ as Messiah, yes. as Lord. They're saying, save. Though they have a little wrong, they think he's going to do some national stuff. It's bigger than what's in their minds, but there's knowing that he is the Messiah. Amen. That he will save. On, and they honor him. Yes. And they say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good because his mercy endures forever. 
from glory to glory. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to bring justice to the poor. He's coming to claim his rightful authority to rule. He's coming and the people are celebrating him as a king of Israel. But that won't last too long because he's going into the city of Jerusalem and after the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees get through, these same people in the crowd will reject him because they've been influenced by the priests. I just thank God for how his word is so powerful. He sent his son from glory to glory. He sent his son to us. He sealed his son. He taught his son. He anointed his son. He honored his son. He commanded his son. He bore witness to his son. He loves, he loved, and he loves his son. He delighted in his son. He heard his son. And now, as he enters into Jerusalem, God is offering up his son for our salvation. And Jesus is going and he's going to fulfill the work that God has given him. Because he knows that after he is offered up, he's going to be raised up He's going to be exalted. He's going to be glorified. He's going to be made the head of the church. Hallelujah. He's going to be everything that his office calls for him to be. As the king. And as the son. And as our savior. We thank you, Father God. We give you praise and thanks, Lord God, for this day. At this time, I'd like to just open up the church. I'm done. My ministry is done. I want to thank God for keeping me up to the wee hours of this morning. (laughs) Hallelujah. I love how God works, you know. You think you got one thing, and he said, "Uh uh-uh. Not that. Hallelujah. I just want to say this morning that God is good. Yes, He is. And there is no broad minded approach when it comes into entering into the life that God has for you. God doesn't present you with a variety of doors and say, go on and choose what you want. He he, he said, and once you pick the door, then I'll I'll stand. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, pick your own door. And whatever you pick, I'll stand beside you. That's not what he does. He gave us one door, one way, one truth, one life. And that way is Jesus Christ. He is the only way, the only door for us to enter into. To enter into God's kingdom. And believe me, it is true that God has a plan for your life. But it can only be entered into when you choose the right door. There is only one gospel to believe. There is only one truth to embrace. There is only one shepherd to follow. Only one savior to trust. Only one Lord to serve. Only one master to obey. So whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, 
a Hindu or a Buddhist, a Muslim or a Rastafarian, whether you are secular or agnostic or an atheist, there is only one way to get into the kingdom of God. Your grandmother can't do it for you. Your mother can't do it for you. Your father cannot do it for you. There's only one way. And that way is through Jesus. If you have never accepted Jesus, today is the day. Now is the day of salvation. We are only given now. So why wait? Serve a God like my God. 
did an awesome job. I heard Minister uh, Dawson did an awesome job on this Wednesday. Amen. Amen. So join us on Wednesday as we come again in the book of Genesis, the 46th chapter. And as we learn what God has and what God is sharing with us in his word. Amen. Then at 10 a.m., uh, we have Harmony Friends. Amen. We're still looking and in need of those who are willing to be willing workers for the Lord. Amen. To come out on Wednesdays at 930. And let us, let's help us as we share, hallelujah, physical food. To those in need, we share and we thank God for every chef and every partner that's partnered with us, amen, amen. to help us in, in this endeavor that God has called us to. We've been doing this since December, and God keeps on blessing us, amen? Amen. amen. God keeps on blessing us. And for this, we are grateful for all that God is doing in this season, Amen. Amen. If all hearts and minds are one accord, let us stand. Amen. Keep it in mind all the announcements and everything that has been shared and said. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God. Father God, we thank you this morning for your messenger, O God, Pastor Bird. We thank you, O God, for the message that came from you, O God. The message that helped us to understand Jesus, everything that you did, O God, and all that you went through just for us. We thank you, O Lord, my God, for healing the sin. We thank you, O oh God, for opening the eyes of those who are blind. We thank you, O oh God, for providing speech for those who are mute. We thank you, O oh God, for healing those with withered hands, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for healing those that were paralyzed. God, your word helps us to understand that you're the same God. And if you did it for them, that you're still the same God with all power in your hand. And that you can do it for us. So do it in this season, O oh God, for your children as we call out and cry out unto you. Lord, as we face our own Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees in our day, we pray, O oh Lord, my God, that we are not discouraged, but Lord, that we're encouraged and continue to move forward in you. Now, God, we pray that you would bless your children as we leave this place but never from your presence. Bless your children, O oh God. Shower and rain down upon them, Father. Give them victory in every area of their life. We thank you, O oh God. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his presence with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, honor, dominion, and power, both henceforth, now, and forevermore. And the church all said, Amen. Amen. Amen.